guys, Brian Stevens here with Mortgage Shots at the National Real Estate Post. I have my about monthly with Valerie where we sit down and talk all things NAM. And we have the incoming president, Jim Neighbors, uh, a gentleman we were just speaking about a, a couple of moments ago. I, we ran across each other about a decade ago, and I think it was at an NBA event. I, I can't remember, but I specifically remember the nature of our conversation. I was like, this guy knows this industry forwards and backwards. So I'm really excited to hear some of the stuff that you have to say, not only on this uh, interview, but ones that we have going forward. Now, Valerie, let's start with this. You were looking at some numbers from Freddie Mac on house purchasing, affordability, things of that nature. You drew a couple of things out of that that are pretty darn insightful. So why don't you give us the bird's eye view of, of what you found out? Just for some context, Nam uh, partnered with Freddie Mac and issued a 2024 home buyer report. It is uh, the first TPO focused uh, report that was has been issued by a trade association in conjunction with a GSE. So Freddie Mac provided the data. Our responsibility was to analyze and disseminate the data and then put it in a report that people would want to read. That's uh, kind of where it started. Some of the interesting things were as far as uh, TPO originations from 2018 to 2023, even through the pandemic, although it seemed like maybe a TPO uh, had a larger share of the market, it really has remained consistent and steady about 24% of the market in uh, comparison to retail origination. So I, I find it interesting that through the highs and lows, the percentages still remain the same. That's and also regardless of its purchase or refinance, it's relatively consistent. I would have thought because we hear some of the other louder voices uh, in the brokerage space talking about, you know, the migration coming to the brokerage side of things. And what you're telling me is what you learned is that simply isn't the case. Not according to the numbers. Do you feel that a good or a bad thing? Or do you assign a value to it at all? You know, I think I look at it positively in that regardless of the challenges that the industry has had, um, especially 22, 23, that the value of utilizing a mortgage broker has remained constant with the American public. You know, and I think that's interesting because Jim and I were just speaking about this a moment ago. Jim brought, we were talking about 2008 and, you know, the, the the hiccups we had back then. And the term broker became synonymous with anybody who wrote a loan. And it was bad. It was a negative connotation. And I remember that. I was doing Think Big Work Small at the time. And it dawned on me and what uh, Jim just said a moment ago is like, well, we didn't design any of these products that brought the housing market to its knees, yet we bore the responsibility for those products. And I would even kind of piggyback on that and say, we also didn't underwrite the files that we didn't create. So we didn't have a say in any of that, yet the mortgage loan officer, the broker, seemed to shoulder um, a, a disproportionate amount of responsibility for the problems we had in the past. And it probably, probably goes through to today, and I think we would all agree, or maybe you would disagree, but the most cost-effective way for a consumer to go ahead and get a loan out there and bring it to market is going to be through a brokerage channel. Absolutely. You know, you don't have the the overhead, the HR, the employer, independent contractor, part of it. You just get to have a group of people that are bringing you customers and helping you originate loans. Well, now, what else did you find from the report? Um, some of the other, um, so the report did cover uh, a few different things besides TPO originations. It did also look at um, housing market trends. Some of this is not really anything surprising that, you know, interest rates increased and housing supply remained low. Undersupply is still um, extremely large. New housing completions aren't at the pace that they need to be. But we are seeing certain pockets of the U.S. that are re rebounding. For example, the southern states are definitely in more of a rebounding mode than other parts of the U.S. Condo supply, also not surprising, is higher in the south. Of course, you know, if you're anywhere along the coast, you're going to see a lot of condos, probably people that have second homes or, you know, you may find people transitioning from their single family homes into something that has less maintenance. So it also did look at uh, some home buyer insights, in particular for 2024, where we are seeing the homeownership rates for minorities increasing. So that gap is getting slightly smaller. Uh, you know, Latin households are um, experiencing growth, but, you know, homeownership disparities are still significant. The gap is actually widest in millennials. 
I think that is probably going to change um, as we get more of this millennial sector into that home buying part of life. Continue to monitor that. We also have um, single women home buyers. Single females are quite honestly more likely to become homeowners than single men or even married couples. So I do find that interesting. I, I do a lot of affordable housing and of all of my affordable housing customers, I would say 95% of them, it might be even higher, are single women. Single women are going to buy toy haulers and wave runners and sea doos and quad runners and bass boats and they're not going to buy it all that all that conspicuous consumption they're not going to do it uh, hey i want to ask you this both of you i want to ask you this i i posed this question to dave stevens a little over a year ago and i said to him we were talking about um the uh the income gap amongst underserved communities particularly i was talking about the african-american community i said i said now you look at the two gses they put nearly a trillion dollars into philanthropy working with underserved communities working with minority communities and now we find the home ownership gap is larger today than it was back in the 1960s in certain areas where you could still put a deed of trust that you could not rent or sell that house to an African-American. Has Fannie and Freddie have everything they've done over the past two decades been a catastrophic failure? I mean, I want some for a for trillion bucks, don't you? You know, I, I think, um, I don't think we can place all the blame on Fannie and Freddie because quite honestly, at least from 2008 forward, they're government-sponsored enterprises. They don't get to make decisions. They're the head of them, FHFA, makes their decisions. They just go along with whatever that governmental agency is requiring them to do. But for the past 80 of the 90 years or 70 of the past 90 years, they weren't under conservatorship. And you could actually even make an argument that being under conservatorship, uh, they haven't changed their their trajectory or really even their approach towards uh, underserved communities and getting home ownership numbers up. They, we haven't seen anything by and large. It's been huge. And they are the only ones who threw a trillion dollars at this thing. I mean, how do we, do we look at this and say, you know what, we have an election cycle right before for us. We need to look at things completely differently because what we've done for nearly a century now hasn't had any meaningful effect. I, I think you need to look at a, a few things. One, like Valerie's talking about now the pool of his, Hispanics is, is the fastest growing. Well, previously when, when they were throwing the, as you would say, throwing a trillion dollars at it, um, it was all minorities were the fastest growing and, and keeping up with them with new homes as and new development just hasn't been able to keep pace with the need for housing. I, I think that's been the biggest problem is being able, you know, to to constantly chase uh, where is there a need for housing? You know, an example, if you're building a new house, let's say you decide to move from California to Cleveland, a two by four costs the same in California as it does in Cleveland. Correct. Right. If, you're, if you're building a new home and you can build a new home, where your city is, where the average price is $463,000, are you going to build it there or are you going to build in the inner city of Cleveland where the average house sells for $80,000? I would factor in the cost I would factor in the cost of labor, which is going to be significantly higher in California. I'm going to factor in the cost <laughs> of permits, factor in the cost of taxes, but it's probably I get what you're saying it's probably going to be California. That I I I hear that. Now speaking of some of the prohibitive costs that we have, we hear it from both of our candidates right now. Um what we're going to do to fix housing. For the first time that I can remember, housing is starting to become an issue that our candidates are talking about on a national, state, and local level. But do you hear anything meaningful from either one of our presidential candidates that sounds positive to you like things could change and we can get some of these properties built or the the cost of um uh, you know, your vertical builds any less expensive than they've been in the past? I, I think people look at it two different ways. People don't look at the cost of how, you know, I always, they look at, you know, everything revolves around the interest rate. The problem with, you know, we have the millennials, which are the most educated, the most open-minded, the most diverse ever, but they have the least amount of financial education of any generation ever because the school, if it's not on the test, they don't learn it. They don't learn how to balance a checkbook, so they certainly don't know about interest rates. And having lived through COVID, they just assumed the interest rates, as you and I were talking earlier, should be 25 to 3%. Uh, last time I became president of NAM, I was very excited to announce that day in 2005 that interest rate had dropped to 65 
and 2,000 people went nuts. We were all excited about six and a half. Now you talk to people about six and a half and they're like, you should be in jail. Yeah. You know, these rates are just crazy. But people don't really, they keep forgetting. You're not making an interest rate. You make a monthly payment. And I think Barry Habib put a, a, a nice program together where he was talking about, look at total debt. All right. You, you talk about your how much the houses have increased. How much has your pickup truck increased? Yeah. I just, one of our mutual friends is looking at a new pickup truck and it's over $100,000. And I'm like, yeah. what are you even thinking about? But, you know, so all the cost has went up. I, I do think, you know what? I don't know all the details of the $25,000 uh, down payment assistance plan. But again, it, it depends on what it's geared for. Is it, you know, first time home buyers, every kid wants to live, buy their first house to be just like their parents. Yeah. They forget that their parents, that might be their third or fourth house. They started in uh, a condo and then they moved to us, you know, uh, maybe a smaller home. And then, you know, but the younger generation, they just figure, OK, my parents have a twenty six hundred square foot four bedroom colonial. But that's where I want to start. Uh, you know, my incomes, I, I'm making more money than they, they were. But you also have all that surrounding debt that goes with it. You, you don't have, as your parents did, a, a $20,000, you know, you have a $100,000 car payment. And it's like, you got to just, I think, use some more common sense. But to just, you know, to go back and, and say, well, Betty and Fanny threw money away. No, they didn't. Uh, it, it went for good purposes. Maybe not. It didn't get spread out the way everybody intended to. But I think it's, uh, you know... There's been some positive resorts having, you know, Valerie and I both do low to moderate income housing. Uh, but, you know, now with the younger generation, it's like, OK, getting them to understand financial education so that they can decide what they're going to go. And, you know, none of us can decide on what I haven't heard any, you know, I haven't heard any details on on what uh, former President Trump is 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 offering. But. Uh, Vice President Harris's plan. I'm like, okay, I, I need to see more details. Is this, you know, yeah. does it depend on where you're buying the house? I mean, is it somebody that says, okay, great, I'm going to buy a five hundred thousand dollar house, and you're going to give me twenty five grand, or is it I'm going to buy a hundred and thirty thousand dollar house, and this twenty five grand I'm going to use for not only down payment, but to do some repairs to this house and rebuild, uh, you know, rebuild the area. Yeah. I think that's what it's supposed to be geared for, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I, I think we're I think we're woefully anemic when it comes to details on either one of the plans. But I, I'm feeling like we're starting to hear some things that are kind of solutions that are a little bit different than maybe we've heard in the past. Then listen, I don't know if any of this stuff is going to work or not work. I don't profess to have the answers. I'm an armchair quarterback. I see things after they've taken place. Um, hey, let's just switch gears for a couple of minutes since we're talking about this, Jim. You are now once again the incoming president of NAM, Valerie. I think you you you're handed this up, baton off in good hands. Uh, you've done a great job here so far. So, what's on the agenda for you as president of NAM? It's different this time around because in 2005 we had a full staff. When I came in, the first thing I did is we need to hire some people, and you know NAM is membership driven, volunteer led. Or did I get it wrong? Is it volunteer led, <laughs> membership driven? Close well, enough. But for the most part. <laughs> It's 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 run by volunteers. So the, you know, the first thing is I, I looked at all right. What do we need to do? Where the association is growing. It's you know, when Valerie is president, it doubled in size. You know, which is great. Uh, sometimes it's easier to follow somebody that's uh, not been good because you're going to be compared to them. But you know, she's left me in pretty good shape. So the first thing I looked at is what's going to be best for NAM. Volunteers, business is picking up. Every volunteer is more busy than they've been in, in, in a while. So I naturally want to do hire two people. And that's exactly what I did. I hired Valerie and well, the board hired Valerie at my recommendation as our chief executive strategist. Uh, and I locked up Rocky Andrews, and I've known Valerie for maybe 10 years, a little over that. And I've known Rocky Andrews for 20 years. He's in uh, Arizona, and he is our chief financial officer. And his passion isn't, nobody's passion is uh, looking at the financials, but his is really education. So not only does he handle the financial side, but he handles the education side. Valerie's biggest pan, uh, passion is 
one is government affairs, but two, she also likes doing all that, uh, you know, that technical stuff, you know, like these things. And so I, I think NAM's positioned itself to uh, be able to expand on that. What my greatest goal is, is to recruit more members to participate in committees that want to get involved in leadership. You know, vol finding volunteers now when business is beginning to pick up, their, their time is limited. So it's like, okay, how much can I be involved? But we can't, I never thought I would be president of NAM again after 2005. And I think I'm only the third, third president ever who's uh, had more than one term. Rocky Andrews was the one before me. And then the late Don Frommer, uh served three years uh, back in the 2008 when everybody was uh, having problems. So I'm coming in at a good time. My goal is to recruit as many committee members. Our, our, our committee chairs are out there reaching out to people. Um, Valerie's put some great, if you haven't been already received an email, you are on whether it's communications or government affairs or education or technology. We want to expand all those committees and get those people involved and find out, okay, who's decided, you know what, I could be president now. Because, you know, I, as I said at our, our annual in, um, in Las Vegas two weeks ago, if I can be president now, anybody can be president now. If you're willing to put in the time and the effort to succeed, you should, but it's being willing to put the time and the effort in to succeed. Also look at, you know, the other goal is the number one issue with mortgage brokers are trigger leads. Trigger leads. Oh, the God. Oh, number God. Number one thing is trigger. They're horrible. They're horrible. And we think we, we've been working on this for four or five years. We think we have a really good shot at getting this passed. And it doesn't matter who wants to take the credit. The issue is, did it get done? There's enough credit that can be passed around among other people, but working behind the scenes, which a lot of people don't like to work behind the scenes. They want to say, oh, I, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. All we want to do is see if we can get this passed, be successful, and then there'll be enough credit to go around for everybody. But this has been our, you know, our number one focus uh, for the last at least four years. I think it would have went faster, but it is the government we're dealing with regulators, right. legislators, but ultimately, uh, if we get that through, that'd be great. You know, there's uh, a bunch of other issues that we're working on and setting our agenda for what we're gonna do there. And at the same time, Valerie set us on a nice path. I believe she added three states as president, uh, last one being the state of California, joined, reaffiliated back with NAM, and the state of Washington and the state of Illinois. I got to sign up Montana which is also a nice state. Um, a beautiful state, yeah. Yeah, it's not California, but um, another place you might want to consider moving, Montana. It's, but, you know, so my whole agenda is just growing the association and, and find the next generation of, of leadership for now. That's that's my entire intention. So let's talk about focus. We said you got a good focus. So let's talk about focus. We have focus coming up in front of us. What can we expect from that event? So it's January 9th to the 11th, uh, 2025 at Margaritaville in Orlando. Once again, what we did is we looked at um, some of the of our um, top speakers from NAM National and brought those to the East Coast. So we have um, Neil Dingra with Ford Academy. We have Barry Habib again. We're going to have Carl White. Uh, we have Megan Anderson. We have Michelle Berman. We have Chelsea Gardner. But another thing that we're also going to do is um, we are also going to have a variety of panels focused on different topics, non-QM, the various broker models themselves, you know, what is the best one for you. And then, of course, we're also going to offer our two certifications, FHA and Reverse. So there'll be a little of something for everybody. Plus, no snow. Sounds fantastic. Well, listen, to both of you, great luck going forward with everything. Good job thus far. And we'll be chatting you up real soon again. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.